Uh, okay. Um, so, also to warn you, this I I only loosely prepared for this because uh, because I thought that's what I was supposed to do because <laughs> this was because we have up to two hours and. <laughs> Uh, okay, <laughs> so uh, uh, theorem, uh, I don't know whose theorem this is, but it doesn't matter right now. So let, let K in, in S3 uh, be a tame knot. Okay. Um, th there, here is some topology that you may not have seen. Wh what the word tame is for? The knots that you think of, they're the knots that you think of that you that, that actually can be thickened to a rope. So the the, the term for that is is uh, can be collared or has a tubu tubular neighborhood. Those are called tame, and in this dimension, although not always in higher dimension, uh, higher dimensions tame surfaces. Um, uh, can can be made smooth or, or can be made polygons. Somewhat incredibly, in a high enough dimension, there exist knots, higher dimensional knots up there, up in the cloud somewhere, that are that have a tube around them, but a fractal tube. But they're fractals, and the tube is fractals, fractal, and you can't fix it. But it does not happen for one-dimensional knots. Okay. <laughs> there are also wild knots that don't have tubes around them, and this talk is not about that. For one, one, for one thing. There's a data problem. How do you even describe a wild knot to a computer? Okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, the theorem that um, uh, k is trivial if and only if um, pi one uh, of S three minus k um, I equals z. Uh, is isomorphic to z if and only if pi 1 of s3 minus k uh, is abelian. Okay. <laughs> and then you also have the theorem that uh, the knot group is uh, the abelianization is always isomorphic to z. Okay. <laughs> always. So this is the criterion that uh, my uh, construction is based on. So the, the, this is what we are attacking. But for our purposes, it, uh, you can describe the knot group just from a knot diagram that everybody is familiar with. Um, so you don't, you don't have to talk about fundamental groups of, of surfaces. You can talk just about finally presented groups that can be described easily from a knot diagram. Uh, that's true. So I guess I might as I guess I might as well uh, I I guess I might as well give that. So Vertinger's description, Ver Vertinger's presentation of uh, the knot group. It looks. Uh, let, let me draw a knot. See what you should come away with, uh, you know, looking up a paper and getting theorems for knots. That's th th that's fairly standard. But after many decades of practice, I finally could draw a knot on the board. <laughs> <laughs> At least a trefoil. I'm not sure about any others. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 the real pecking order in geometric topology. How how well you can draw knots. <laughs> um, but. It, in the Verdinger presentation of the, fun of the fundamental group, I was even asked whether I should define fundamental groups. But do I need to define well fundamental groups? No, you don't. I don't think you do. But maybe if somebody else asks you, you can. But okay, I will. I really want to focus you on this because there's not ever No other groups you need. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, but a anyway, if you would like to think about fundamental groups of spaces in general, then the, the, the convention for the Verdinger's presentation is that the base point of the, f of the fundamental group is put at your eye, 
and then these arrows refer to generators of the fundamental group. Uh, the arrow actually passes underneath, and the loop, the, the loop generating passes from your eye under the strand and back to your eye. Okay, so that, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so uh, in any case, from that geometric origin, you you can just you can just take the algebraic description if you like. For every bridge, which means a, a bridge is a strand that pass that a bridge can pass over several roads at once. Okay, so for every strand that passes over, passes over some number of things, there's a generator, uh, A, B, uh, C. Uh, and even if it passed over two, it would still just be one generator. Okay. <laughs> every bridge. Well, a strand could mean an edge between two crossings. No, no, I mean just a connected piece. A connected piece means it's... Uh, right, that's several, that's several edges of the graph. Yeah, yeah but in the, if you just look at it as a, it's a bunch of uh, Arcs. pieces of string, so every piece of string has a generator. Yeah, you could say it that way. That's, that's fine. <laughs> um, but the, but uh, in in the standard tr what you call a piece of string is, is called a bridge, and uh, what you call but then there are also edges if you think of it as a tetra tetravalent graph and an edge is a little bit smaller than a bridge. Okay. It is a bridge. It goes. A, it's a bridge that. It, yeah. <laughs> Bridges, bridges, end, uh, bridges end when they enter, when they pass underneath, and they don't have to, no. Yeah. <laughs> but, but in fact, it, it's moot because, you can, you, because there is the type 2 Reitemeister move. So if you have a bridge that goes over nothing, uh, you can get rid of it anyway. So you can just pre-process pre the, the graph so it doesn't have that, okay? <laughs> the knot diagram so that it doesn't have that. Uh, so anyway, the, re the, the relation is that, so here's A, uh, here's B, C, and here's A. And so then there's uh, Verdinger's relation, which is that A, B equals C, A. Yeah, you have to put an orientation on the knot. Uh, so that, uh, I mean, you do and you don't. You get the same group either way, but, but you, want to, you, you want to pass underneath by the right-hand rule. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, so orient the knot uh, for convenience. Don't think that you'll get a different group if you orient it the other way. There's an obvious isomorphism. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so if you t if you t if you take all of these relations, so you you have uh, uh, that pi one of S three minus k is isomorphic to um, uh, generated by bridges uh, a, a b, and with the relation that for for crossings. A, B equals C, A. You get one relation for each crossing. So you have a group like that. So, uh, no, I'm not going to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it comes from a cell decomposition of the knot, a complement of the knot. So, uh, so there are various ways to prove it, but the, th the theorem is that the, this group is invariant. <laughs> Actually, whether or not it's invariant, uh, you have uh, this, <laughs> and and all of that holds true. Okay. And for the of this, uh, what is our close relation? For each crossing, there is a relation like this. Each crossing has three bridges meeting. Well, two of them might be this, the, some of them might be the same, 
So for e you, you start with a generator for each bridge, and then for each crossing, you have the bridges that, that, that go to that crossing, and you impose this relator, this relation. Right, and so actually if you would like to be completely combinatorial, you could do it, th rather than using fancy topology, you could do, you, you could just be a combinatorialist who uh, ignores the deeper music. You could take as a definition of a knot the equivalence class under the right of Meister moves. Once upon a time, it was, it was taken as the definition of a knot. Diagrams up to these moves. Now, now it's a theorem that these, that these moves suffice. Um, but in, in fact, it's not difficult to check, if you, if you prefer just to be an algebraist, that uh, the group that you get by this formula is invariant under these three moves. Okay. You can just do it directly like that. The trefoil happens to have three generators, right, because it has three bridges in that picture. A actually, uh, in another diagram, it has only two bridges. There's something called the bridge number, which is the minimum. <laughs> okay. <coughs> well, that's okay. This looks interesting, too. But <laughs> No, more than n relations. Um, no, wait a minute. No, I'm sorry. Precisely n relations because. Yeah, the number of bridges equals the number of. Yeah. No. I guess that's true. Uh, so yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess that's true. Yeah. So, uh, so there's some there's something wrong with my definition of a bridge then. May, okay. So it's, it's not standard terminology, but I'm just going to call it a bridge. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can leave out any. You can leave out the last one. Okay. Fine. <laughs> okay. You can leave out any one of the end relators. Okay. <laughs> so let me just jump to the algorithm. Uh, the, the, the NP, maybe, algorithm. Okay. The prover uh, provides a prime P, okay, and uh, uh, matrices uh, rho in A, rho of B in um, SL two Z mod P, okay. <laughs> that uh, satisfy the relations and uh, uh, do not uh, all commute, which is then equivalent to uh, the condition that they are not all equal. And uh, that's all. <laughs> okay. So there's the theorem and the 
theorem one, okay, and theorem two, um, uh, P uh, exists, but uh, it is the unconditional theorem is that the prime exists, but it just might be big, okay. <laughs> um, P of order uh, exp of, of uh, poly and n, uh, n is the size of the input. Right, the, but you need uh, you need. No, no, no. no, you don't need. No, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, that's right. I'm off by one. P <laughs> uh, is order x of x. Well, the algorithm is um, the algorithm for uh, a verifier who who waits for uh, a certificate from a prover. That the oh right um, uh, to to cho to show that uh, <laughs> k is not n is not equivalent to the unknot. Okay. <laughs> Okay. The, the the input the input is a knot diagram, like that. Okay. Well, uh, as a planar graph with la labeled uh, with with vertices with decorated vertices, so that you. Okay. <laughs> okay. No. Uh, right? No, no. In fact, that's uh, in in fact for comparison, may, maybe a, a better topic of this talk is both both results together. Uh, although I will concentrate on mine. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, but I'll, yeah, I, yeah. I'll give I'll give more details. But I, okay. So first, let me finish. This is a, this is a type of certificate to show. Uh, to, to sh to that's clearly convincing. Um, first of all, this is this this if and only if is just because you can see that the relations are all by conjugation. So if they all commute, they're all equal. Okay. Uh, no, I'm not finished. <laughs> okay. Uh, if GRH is true, um, or the weaker. Uh, L O W conjecture. <laughs> this is great. Uh, Ligarius and Lisko Weinberger. The conjecture that there is a low prime for this purpose. <laughs> okay. Okay. Then P is uh, order of X of poly of N. Okay. So it's just a question. So the prover can do his job. The, 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 the only question, no matter what, the only question is how long he has to talk in, in, in this type of certificate. Okay. 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 So for comparison. Um, there's a theorem that K is isomorphic to the unknot is in NP. Okay, to answer your question, to begin to answer your question, and the certificate is something more direct. In this case, uh, the certificate is uh, a disk uh, 
uh, d with where the boundary of d is k. Okay. <laughs> um, and the this disk in oh, see I'm not that great of a student of drawing knots, but I'll, okay. <laughs> well, this one won't have one because it's not <laughs> okay. But I will draw a case where you where you do have such a disk. If you have an unknot like that, then the di then here is the disk in this simple case. Ta da! There's a disk whose boundary, okay, and uh, d uh, the area of d or the combinatorial area it doesn't matter really the combinatorial area, but you can just call it the area um, is actually not good enough. It's order of x plus the input. So don't imagine trying to describe uh, the disk directly. Uh, so sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes it's as big as exponential. Uh, but uh, D has an abbreviated uh, binary encoding. Well, the certificate is more than just the prime. The certificate is the prime and row. And the, the cyclic, the, the cyclic, the trivial row is always available. So this is saying, so, so the, <laughs> it, both, both situations are truly in the spirit of, of NP versus co-NP because, because they, they really tell you nothing about what does not exist. If, if it is the unknot, or if, a if, a, if, uh, if the prover is lying to you, he can, he can, for every prime, for every single prime, present to you the trivial row the, where you get a cyclic image. And it's telling you nothing about. There is no certificate of this kind for the unknown. None that I know of. <laughs> yeah? None, none that I know of. It's, it, it, it's not, I don't, I don't know of any interpretation of this result. Well, of course, it's related to, to, to fundamental group theory, but fundamentally, this is a surface, this is a surface explanation, not a group explanation. I, I Well, oh, that's getting into, uh, well, okay, I've, maybe, but uh, it's not on my mind at all. <laughs> what? Well, all right, but I, I don't know. Th this is the way that I understand this, th this stuff. It, it fundamentally, it's explaining what the certificate is the disk. Fundamentally here, the certificate is a group representation. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so not, not the un this is you have an unknot here, okay? And it, actually, the, the binary encoding is is very simple-minded. If you if you arrange the if you just take you can work directly from the knot diagram. You don't you you don't have to work with tetrahedra. You sort of put the disk in a kind of shrink wrap form, okay? You 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 make the, you make your bed well so the sheets are all taut, and then the sheets stack up a lot, and then you you you, you can list integers explaining how the sheets stack up and also how many sheets fold around the wire. And, and that, that's the binary compression. <laughs> okay. Uh, but anyway, I, but, uh, let, let's, let's do this case first. <laughs> yeah? Is there any bound, you know, like a number of moves you would need to take a knot in this general? Well, in fact, okay. So uh, there's the f part of the interest in this work was <laughs> I mean, Joel Haas is actually down the hall from me, 
And one, th one th piece of order of business that he wanted to take care of was the NP algorithm. But another order of business that was interested to him was exactly that question. In fact, he started with that, and, and the algorithmic complexity sort of came later to his thinking. And you do get a bound from the area of the disk because you can just shrink the curve along the disk. But notice this exponential, so you get a terrible bound. Well, maybe it's not terrible, I'm not sure. Right. <laughs> right. Now, in, in fact, just next month, there is a talk titled in Lyon given by Mark Lackenby, where he claims a polynomial number of Reitermeister moves. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure what he's thinking, uh, but there, 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 is more, there has been more progress on Reitermeister moves, but it won't be from this method because the disk is too big. <laughs> okay. I can make guesses about what method he uses, but that's a digression. Uh, so in a sense, the qualitatively, I mean very coarsely, very roughly, the, competitive bound, the old competitive bounds for published results rather than talk titles come from this technique, but you, it's fundamentally exponential. But, you, but yeah, you do get a bound on moves that way. Okay. Now, if you wanted to search for the moves, then, then you, you get a double exponential hit because you have to search for an exponential length sequence by, by this yeah. bound. Um, well, I said that there were two styles of doing this. Okay, one style was to uh, observe that uh, was to was to observe that a, a vertex solution with Euler characteristic one must be a ver yeah to observe that a vertex solution must be connected. Okay. <laughs> Now, uh, so this has some integer programming inside, and sometimes you're lucky, and an, an integer uh, solution is also a rational extremum, so that's called a vertex solution to the integer programming problem. And uh, if you did, if, if you were, if life was good enough that you found a vertex solution, then you would know that it's connected automatically, okay? And then you just compute the Euler characteristic, which is linear, and you just see that it's a disk. So uh, there's a theorem that in the genus zero case, there is a vertex solution. Uh, for, for, for higher genus, you have to work harder because nobody knows that it has to be a vertex solution. Instead, then, they, had, they, they went through this result again. And in fact, the, the title of the paper is exactly that, getting an upper bound on the genus. Okay. They simply directly learn, they learned how to directly compute the number of components. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so anyway, so for, uh, this, alg for this algorithm now, uh, let me uh, say something about how to get started. In the old days of topology, before Thurston, uh, uh, it was not even known that this group was residually finite at all. Now, never mind residually, f uh, never mind having a representation like this. For all people knew, uh, its maximal residual quotient was just z, actually. That could happen sometimes, okay? <laughs> so the, 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 for, for all people knew, there would exist knots where, where pi 1 is doing something very exciting, but it's just completely impenetrable. <laughs> um. Whoa. I don't know what. Oh, I see. <laughs> So I want to state two theorems, one of which is more familiar and is the real inspiration for this. Okay. Um, um, theorem of, first of all, theorem of Thurston and Hempel, that pi 1 of S3 minus K is uh, residually finite.
Okay. And then theorem of Thurston. Um, uh, if K is not a satellite, not, then uh, either one if k is hyperbolic and the knot group embeds in SL2C. Um, and the embedding is uh, discrete and um, uh, finite volume uh, quotient. We don't need that part right here, but, but anyway, you get an em embedding, okay? Um, and 2K is a torus knot, and then pi, pi 1 of S3 minus K is uh, well understood. Um, it, it embeds in SL2R or, or I don't remember all of my geometric topology right this uh, uh, moment. Maybe some extension. Okay, maybe some central extension. Okay, <laughs> something like that. Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, a group is so. Uh, so there's a phenomenon that that up to halting uh, up to halting completeness. Uh, groups can be completely indistinguishable from the trivial group or from, from any familiar group that you like. And the residual finiteness condition is one important way that, that a, a group might be uh, uh, comprehensible. The, the, it's the condition that every element uh, can be distinguished from the identity by a finite quotient. <laughs> so uh, you, as a, using finite groups as your, as your assistant, then you, you can you can interpret the elements of the, of the, of the group, all of, all of them, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so there's a theorem that finitely generated matrix groups are residually finite, and it's related to this theory, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, first, I didn't say what a satellite knot is. Well, I'll just just to say briefly. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, a satellite knot is is uh, a knot laced inside of a tube, which is another knot. Okay out or not, okay. Well, no, actually, I might get to that. If I get to the result about S3, then, then this consideration becomes important, <laughs> okay? So then, then, then you have the satellite inside. Okay. So actually, what Thurston really proved was something more beautiful for knots. Uh, every knot decomposes by satellites into a collection of uh, link complements, and those are all hyperbolic or uh, tor or tor torus links, and, and n nothing else can happen. <laughs> okay, but just for knots, you have you have these two cases when you don't have a satellite knot. So you can so there's the so now. 
there's a general uh, 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 algebra principle, uh, loosely speaking, the complex numbers can be appro approximated by uh, the algebraic numbers, and those can be approximated uh, by Z mod P, where P is a large prime. Well, it's u it's useful it's useful both as back just to explain where the result comes from, and it's also in in a more controlled form. It's useful for a for the actual theorem. Okay, so the simplest version of this uh, shows um, the theorem of Maltsev that. Um, residually linear is equivalent to residually finite. Or actually, his, what he showed was that linear is equivalent. Uh, linear implies residually finite, but then also you can just say that residually linear is, is outright, outright equivalent to residually finite. Right, L linear, right, it means, yeah, and finitely generated. Linear means matrix group. Okay. <laughs> because if it's, if it's linear, the lin matrix group over C. But then if you have the matrix group over C, if you use finitely generated, then both, both approximations hold. Okay. <laughs> so, the, so, so this is what you do. You first... Uh, maybe the matrix representation involves some transcendental numbers, but you can replace them with algebraic numbers by wiggling the representation if that's what happens. And then after that, uh, if you have finite matrices and only finitely many generators, then, then all of the matrix entries lie in some field, some fixed uh, finite extension field, and then you can replace that field by Z mod P because there are only so many different algebraic numbers and denominators that appear in the matrix entries. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's a, a brief summary of this classic result of Malsev, which by current standards is, is not a difficult result. So that's the real answer to your, your question here. <laughs> okay. Um, so you can already see, so this, this already, uh, suggests um, the algorithm for non-satellite knots. Okay. And this theorem of Thurston is now um, roughly 30 years old and some, something that you have to, I, not that many people learn how to prove it, but uh, a lot of people learn the statement of the theorem. And uh, so uh, for a lot of knots, the ones that aren't satellites, you, 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 already, have, you already have the idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'm calling it Thurston Hempel because it's a, it's a corollary of the second theorem underneath that's due to Thurston. Th that's the real workhorse. The, as a corollary, it's due to Hempel. <laughs> yeah, Hempel had to work harder for that case. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, he, for satellite knots, because he had to piece together the finite quotients for the different hyperbolic pieces, and he figured out a way to do that. For, in the setting of showing residual finiteness. Okay. And this is what you were mentioning about the linear representation and one not gluing well with. The yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the, <laughs> there is a torus, it's called the peripheral subgroup. There's a torus at the end, so there's a z plus z, z cross z subgroup of pi 1. And then you have that for, e for the two different pieces if you have the satellite knot. 
but the representations might be different, and there's no obvious way to piece them together. People think it's possible to piece, to piece them together by deforming the representations, but that's a very difficult theory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. Um, so the, the quickest way out, I, the paper, I, if this is all I'd known, the paper I would have written is, is that, that, uh, that certifying that a non-satellite, if you have the promise that it's not a satellite knot, then there's an, an algorithm in NP. Uh, um, but there are two ways out uh, if you have a satellite knot. One way is to find these tori and cut, but that's, that's more complicated. The simpler way out is to use another theorem of Kronheimer and Rivka, which I will state. Uh, okay. Uh, if, if K isn't the unknot, uh, there exists a representation, uh, a uh, non abelian representation rho from the knot group um, to SU2. And this theorem uses uh, gauge theory rather than hyperbolic geometry. So uh, it uses a very fashionable t topic on this campus, which is uh, the yang mills equations in four dimensions. <laughs> um, uh, hyperbolic geometry is not unfashionable, but, but I, I would say taking all of IAS gauge theory is much more fashionable at the moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yes, it's a yang mills theorem. Okay. Anyway, it's, it, that's settled. It doesn't use quantum Yang mills. It uses classical Yang mills. So it's a little bit, it's, it's not quite that horrible, but, but <laughs> it, 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 this is also a difficult theorem. Probably harder than the other one. Okay. So anyway, now we've gotten started. Um, now you can use the Maltsev point of view, and uh, you know immediately that a prime exists. You just, you just don't. So this is. Yeah, it's SU2, yeah. okay, which happens to be, which we can say, well, I, I don't care that it's SU2, which happens to be a subgroup of SL2C, so, so you're cooking with gas, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so just directly using nothing more than Maltsev's theorem, there is a certificate of this type, but if you only take the words of Maltsev's paper, you have no control over how big it is. Sure, but that means there is a non-commutative quotient, so fine. Why is it so many non-commutative Every element can separate it. I guess you can separate the commutator. Right. Right, you separate a commutator. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, right. Okay. So. Now, bounding the prime P. Okay. So, rho from uh, pi 1 to S3 um, to uh, to um, uh, SL2C is equivalent to um, uh, uh, a set of Verding Verdinger equations 
on matrices. Okay. It's just that the matrices have to satisfy the same equations. Okay. Uh, polynomial uh, equalities. Uh, uh, various uh, polynomial expressions are equal, uh, and but those are just quadratic. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right. Right. And and you can put you you can say that they're quadratic equations. Although okay. since there are many of them and they're multivariate, that buys you nothing. That they're just quadratic. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Uh, and. Uh, some inequalities. And, uh, and uh, if these, by inequalities I mean not equal. I don't mean less than or, le or, or greater than because then, then, then I'd be sunk. Okay. Try not to guarantee that it's not uh, trivial or good. Or, uh, more subtly that it's not an Im a cyclic image <laughs> because f for, for the unknot there's a Z quotient. Okay. Uh, but, yet, but one way or another, there's some inequalities. <laughs> and so, so this, part is, uh, this part is all I'm really using. Okay. Now we can forget all of the topology and be uh, algebraic geometers and number theorists for the rest of the talk <laughs> uh, or for the rest of the proof. Okay. And then there's the theorem. Of Paran, which can be stated this way that NPZC uh, is contained in AM. <laughs> That's one, one way to state the theorem. Uh, I.e., um, uh, there exists um, a <laughs> uh, 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 so I actually I'll define the left side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll, def I'll define NPZC. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is solvability of polynomial. Uh, solvability in C of polynomial equations over Z. Okay. So that's the definition of this complexity class. You can view it as a you can view it as a problem or as a complexity class. In in, in there's a sort of Blum Manuel Blum point of view, it's a complexity class rather than one problem. But you can but either way. The idea is that that you can you can think of these polynomial equations as a circuit condition using arithmetic circuits over Z. And now the question is whether there is a complex number that satisfies the circuit. Okay. So what, what he showed is that it's in AM. And what? Arthur Merlin. So uh, very briefly, um, in NP, there is, there's a prover who you can call Merlin. And there's a verifier who you can call Arthur. And uh, Arthur has no imagination. So uh, uh, I guess my joke was that you could call it, it, he's not Arthur, he's Percival, so that you can use the letter P. <laughs> but anyway, the verifier has no imagination whatsoever. He does something deterministic. So the prover just might as well just explain the proof to, to the verifier. Uh, Percival, uh, even if Percival had a question, since he has no randomness, the prover knows what the question is. <laughs> you, uh, uh, you were going to ask this question, and my answer is. <laughs> and so he explains the proof, and then the verifier just checks it. In the Arthur Merlin protocol, uh, Arthur uh, gets to ask the prover a question based on random choices, and then Merlin answers it. And Arthur becomes statistically convinced. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, 
just like a they're both like a seminar. So NP is a seminar in which the audience asks no questions, and uh, 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 Arthur Merlin is a seminar in which um, the audience gets to ask questions with random choices before the talk begins. <laughs> now, there's a theorem that, that you get the same Arthur Merlin if, uh, the, if the audience gets to ask questions in a bounded number of rounds. Okay? that you don't get anything stronger that way. There's another theorem that if the audience is a, a allowed a polynomial of random rounds, then you get something much larger. But with a bounded number of rounds, uh, you might as well just ask the questions at the beginning. In fact, the theorem is that you might as well just let the random, you, you had to flip coins to ask your questions, and you might as well just show Merlin the coin flips. He can figure everything else out. <laughs> um, uh, several people, se several results. Gold, gold, why, gold, Well, one of the theorems I was quoting was. Yeah, Baba Moran is one, and Goldwasser Sipser is is uh, the one of those theorems is bounded is bounded rounds. The other theorem is that you might as well just show the Merlin the coin flips at the beginning of the talk. The public coin theorem. Okay. Um, so there's a conjecture that AM is equal to NP, by the way, um, <laughs> so that you don't need the randomness. Oh, no, no, no. Clearly AM is bigger because the audience can choose not to ask questions. Okay. Uh, so the proof uses precisely uh, what I was talking about. Uh, Precisely that. So, so, uh, uh, so my my result is is a corollary of proof. Oh, oh, right, and the low conjecture. <laughs> Oh uh, right. Uh, uh, given given G R H or long. Um, now, actually, let me make the remark that from the behavior, of, from the sort of tone of talking to Peter Sarnak last time, uh, yesterday in the talk and after, on the one hand, uh, and and other number theorists. On the one hand, number theorists. Uh, I haven't stated the low conjecture yet, but I will uh, freely admit that, that it's it's vastly weaker than GRH. On the other hand, um, they're skeptical that you should. They're a little bit skeptical that you should really think of it as easier. <laughs> they don't know. Maybe if you're smart enough to prove this, you're smart enough to prove this too, for all anyone knows. So, so and if that's the case, you, you should. You, you don't get, it doesn't necessarily buy you anything to, to, to say that the hypothesis is this. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> right, so he needs this to, to make. But even unconditionally, um, he gets... Um, so, uh, other otherwise, you get either NP exp or AM exp, and and that, that's the way un unconditionally you get the other bound. Okay. Right now, when I mentioned this to Coran, he was surprised that I got NP instead, but what I've said so far makes clear what happens. The reason that he he needs NP uh, needs AM is that for what he's doing, one prime is not convincing. Okay. Uh, it can happen. This this approximation is, is is only so good. For it can happen that there is a modular solution, but no complex solution. So he really needs a regular supply supply of primes, and in order to then be convinced that there are enough primes, uh, it needs to be in an interactive. So in what he's doing, in f in fact, the audience says, "Well, is, can you find a prime in this range?" 
and and if and uh, Merlin has to be on his toes and 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 pro provide a, a prime in any of many ranges for that reason, and that's what that that's what makes this work. Be because you can have something that looks like a solution for just one prime. But w but for the knot theory, once you once you know that the knot group is not abelian, you're done. You, you can forget about the the old question of whether there is a complex solution. Okay. So so that's where the extra strength comes from. So now let me review what Quran is doing. What? Ah, that's a detail that I want to get to. Um, it was known since long before any of this. To it was known to Hilbert, Hilbert and Rabinowitz that that these yes he does, but because this part is not important. Okay, <laughs> there's a there's a clever way to convert. Uh, this type of condition to that type of condition. Okay, so let me mention, let me answer that question. <laughs> so this is called uh, the Rabinowitch trick. Okay, um, uh, to convert. Uh, not equal to equal. Okay. Um, uh, X is not equal to zero if and only if you're going to what? Right. <laughs> right. X T is equal to one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. However, what I've written is slightly too weak. Uh, uh, the condition, the non-commutation condition, or or is that one matrix does not equal to another matrix. So this is a scalar inequality, and it's not quite what I need. But that's okay also. Okay. <laughs> so x a vector is not equal to zero vector. If and only if x dot t is equal to one <laughs> for a new new variables uh, t or t. Okay. Okay. So the so there goes that. <laughs> okay. You throw in more variables. You you have to be creative. Yeah, you have to throw in more variables. <laughs> and more, and, and, no, the same number, of, uh, actually fewer equations. Well, the inequalities get, several inequalities, well, yeah, no, the same, the number of equations stays the same, but more variables. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. But, but you, you have to be creative because you need more variables. <laughs> okay, so that's that's that part. Okay. Right. So now uh, the real engine for Coran's theorem is the Hilbert null Stolzatz. Uh, or if you like, I mean what the what null Stolz Well, yes, effective null Stalinsatz, but, 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 but le, let me explain what's going on. Um, um, number th so my brother-in-law is a number theorist. Uh, so he, so no, number theorists are algebraic geometers in one variable. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I. GRH and LOW are number theory conjectures, uh, and P is is one prime. So uh, we would like to reduce to one variable. 
Now, if you have two variables, everyone knows how you reduce to one variable. You use resultants. Okay. The null Stalinzatz is not even effective null Stalinzatz, but the null Stalinzatz in general is, is, is the same as multivariate result resultants. That's what null Stalinzatz means. But then to get good bounds in complexity yeah, theory, you need effective null Stalinzatz. Well, well right. Algebra, the, you, know, if you have a system of linear uh, equations which does not have a solution, you can plot traces. Right? Yeah, one way to get. So it's a duality theorem. I mean, the result is a, you know, linear, you know, with, uh, whether you have one or many variables, it's, uh, you know, it's just an extension of the obvious or trivial duality of linear. Okay. Also the case of polynomials of higher degree. Okay, well. Any number of variables. You're absolutely correct, but. I'm only going to apologize so much for the order in which I learned it. When I was more of a computer scientist, I went to SIGGRAPH and the computer graphics meeting. And I learned about the following thing that, that or I had learned around then around about the following thing. that. There's a beautiful determinant formula for when two polynomials in one variable have a common root, the resultant. Okay. And if you have equations in two variables, you can use the resultant to eliminate one of the variables. And th this is, in fact, used in computer graphics. And so you could iterate and just keep, keep doing it. But, there's a but the null Stalinsatz is a much better organization of the whole thing. Because you immediately, because you immediately lift, le leap from a whole bunch of variables to, to zero, or if you prefer, you could withhold one and, and reduce to one variable. Okay. So, yes. Okay. So. Uh, Hilbert null Stalin's us. Okay. Um, um, so a polynomial system uh, f of x is uh, equal to zero has no solution over C. Actually, it looks a lot like that, <laughs> a, lot, a lot like the Rubinowitz trick itself. Okay. Yes, it's the duality there. Yeah, you can view it like that, uh, if and only if. So, so x is in uh, C, Cn. Okay. Uh, f is a polynomial map from Cn to Cm. <coughs> Uh, if and only if there exists uh, a companion, which I will call B of X, such that F of X dot B of X is equal to 1. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, oh, right. I mean, in the ring, C and join X. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now the victory is that the first equation is nonlinear in X. But the 
the second equation is linear in B. So, so a nonlinear problem is re is replaced by a linear by by a linear problem, and then you can express solvability with a determinant. Okay. Uh, in the what linear in the coefficients of b, right? To make it useful, yes, but that's what the word effective is for. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So this implies um, if uh, if you reserve uh, this implies uh, let me put it this way uh, a determinant condition for solvability. Once you know degree of B. Okay. Uh, and so, in fact, if you do this in, in, one, in, in one variable, and if you do it carefully, then you get exactly the, the, the 19th century resultant. Um, okay. Okay, so then. Uh, if you if you uh, if you reserve uh, one variable, one coordinate uh, x naught of x, and use uh, h n for the others. then this implies uh, an equation h of x uh, that's, that's just univariate. Okay. <laughs> um, such, such that h of x naught is equal to 0 when, when f of x is equal to the zero vector. Okay. So if you assume that the solution space was zero dimensional, what you're really doing is you have points in Cn and you're projecting on the one axis and then writing the polynomial equation that those that those points satisfy. Okay. Now uh, what if you have to worry about the case that the variety might be higher than zero dimensional? Okay, so it's worth stating what you do for that. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll um, let um, let x equal the solution space f of f of x is equal to zero. Okay, x such that f of x, or I'll say b for variety, okay? Um, if, if the dimension of b uh, is positive, you just sacrifice, uh, toss variables to bring it to zero. So in other words, if, this, if the solution space is some curve, then you just restrict uh, one, of the, one or more of the variables to some convenient value until you get a zero-dimensional solution space, and then you use this null Stellenzatz or resultant theory. Okay. So, you, so this step it comes at no, no, no complexity cost. The complexity cost that you should worry about is the degree of B, as, as Igor was asking.
Well, okay, this is going to be subtle. The, the algorithm knows nothing about, th the algorithm itself knows nothing about the millstone zats. zats. All of the work is to just, just let the algorithm know when, you just, just know when the algorithm can work because the prime is available. Okay. So what we're doing, so before, the whole sphere of the approximation was really about just algebraic numbers. Um, you, can, you can reduce algebraic numbers modulo a prime, but, but when? You can, you can reduce the algebraic number root 2 over 3 mod a prime and just keep going. I guess I could. I just like to think about it this way. <laughs> okay. Well, because my point of, I guess my point of view is, is that I'm willing to replace the rationals by some other number field. And, and then just, well, it's just equivalent, really. But uh, just in this, in one language, you, you, you can, uh, let me just explain the, the point of this approximation, okay? We're working over Q bar, so you might encounter something like this, and uh, that, that won't do for, for a fast algorithm. We'd like to work mod a prime instead. We, li we, we like Z mod P better. So then the question is what, what P can be so that you can interpret root 2 over 3. And P has to satisfy two conditions. It can't be 3. And it has to be a prime such that the square root of 2 exists. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so that's all we're worried about. There is a solution vector x. The components are some numbers. And uh, uh, this disease, if I write it this way, looks quite mild. There are a lot of primes for which root 2 uh, uh, over 3 exists in Z mod p. Okay. So we, we want... Uh, p such that this uh, exists as an element of Z mod P. So for a simple algebraic number, the primes are very easy to find. But if I gave you a really complicated algebraic number, then, then you might have a much more trouble finding a prime that, that has the algebraic number as an element. Well, you, can, you could, uh, and that's fine, but it's not any faster. In fact, in the estimates, um, the the vast in the in the in, in the hard cases, the vast majority of uh, finite fields that are available are prime fields. <laughs> okay, uh, so sure you can, but but you're the, the a few <laughs> just a few. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. This. This. Yeah. Yeah. In in fact, in in the in the correct asymptotics, the you, you're the the finite fields that work for you are overwhelmingly prime fields. So, uh, so you you might as well just talk about primes. It's not even a constant factor. It's like only epsilon of the the good choices are finite or other or non-prime finite fields. Okay. But yeah. Well, uh, see, I'm thinking about multiplication also. So it's not just a vector space business here. Right. But the, so the, the problem is that, that, that the finite field gets bigger too quickly. I mean, of course, if... No, but... Usually, the, okay, the problem is going to be that the degree of this extension is big. Uh, 
Here it's just a quadratic extension, so this is misleading. You're, you're going to have a huge field extension in practice. This is way out of control. So think of a really fat, uh, finite but really fat extension of Q. So this may have <laughs> yeah, so what happens is uh, 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 in, in Quaran's proof, the, the whole thing looks like a failure. The, the, the effect of null style on Zots looks, looks terrible. It gives you some bound, but it doesn't look nearly good, good, good uh, 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 enough. But then at the last minute, GRH pulls the, saves the, catches the fish from the fire, <laughs> puts, saves you from disaster, and things get much better again. Okay. Right. This prime is not exactly small, but but it's much smaller than it's. Then the bounds you ignite. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So so the square root is 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 quite misleading. I'll make it a little bit better. Uh, so take consider the Googleth root of two. <laughs> now what? <laughs> okay. Now now things are more serious. <laughs> okay. Uh, you have a really fat field extension. And yes, you can, t you can take an extension of Z mod P and work in a finite field, but it, that's, that's, not where the, that's not where the good news is. The good, the good news is in the prime field, in fact. Okay. So there's the effect of null Stellenzatz. Uh, which is a theorem of, um, no, not a theorem of Hilbert, the theorem of brown well and um, all R. Okay. Uh, in a way, it's just a theorem, only a theorem of Brownwell, but Kolar improved it to get, uh, in most cases, a perfect bound on the degree of D. Okay. Sharp. Sharp, yeah. yeah. Uh, a sharp bound on the degree of D. But anyway, the degree of D is order uh, exponential in. N and M. And let's see. Um, and I guess log D. Um, where D is the degree of F. That's basically what he got. Um, yeah, I mean, Collar's theorem is sort of natural that way, but it wasn't known. It's a hard result. I mean, Nobody said that the only roots of H are those points. But, it, but I guess Collar showed that sometimes that's true. I, I, so, so, yeah, right. So, 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 yes, you do get the product of the de de degrees, at least in the case that Collar left a few cases. But in the cases that Collar did, yes, you get that. But but H could also have other roots. So it's not as simple as that picture. <laughs> uh, I don't know what the issues. Look, uh, 
I certainly didn't promise anything because I didn't say that H only has those roots. You can have roots at infinity, for instance. Okay. And beyond that, I don't know what the real difficulties are in what Collar was doing. Uh, but in fact, in, in you can actually get some effective null scale stuff via resultant types of proofs too. So sometimes, uh, well, well, okay. you get double exponentials, so you you start you 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 get <laughs> right. But Shahar was uh, was asking for a, a good bound, and that that is what Collar got. For but for reasons that I have not studied, it's difficult. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is, and this also implies that the degree of this H uh, is uh, same, same order, X, X with N, M, and log D. Okay. Um, and actually, there's another thing to know. A actually, uh, if 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 f is is over z, so so is h. That's important. When you you use the fact that deter determinants exists over z, that's another that's an elementary miracle, but a miracle nonetheless. Okay, you, you, you need that. Oh right, yeah, you do. You you also, um, yeah, you get, um, yeah, you you need, right, right. So there's a comparable uh, um, um, bound bound um, if 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 R is the the norm of F, then then capital R, which is the the, the coefficient norm. This is a this is a coefficient norm. Is uh, order x x. Uh, sorry, there's a poly inner polynomial here. Of n m log log d and log log uh, r so, okay <laughs> i think it's i think it's like that R no no this is the numerical complexity numerical height the for the bit the bit complexity one x the bit bit complexity is one exponential so 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 the bit complexity of h is order of x of the bit complexity of f for both degree and coefficient reasons. So this is terrible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now there's one more order of business to take care of. This is only for one of the coordinates, and you've got the others to worry about. But we wanted just a single prime, not separate primes for the different coordinates. Okay. So then. Could you get away with uh, different primes for different coordinates if you assume E or H instead and have the not just low, but the exponential version of low? I don't know. The, the way that. The, 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 the way that Quaran handled it was nice. He used Galois theory. Okay. Okay. So then, uh, uh, Quaran combines uh, uh, the H. He Quaran correctly views it as a as a field extension problem. Uh, the different H's for the coordinates. We, we haven't even really done the, the finite reduction yet. Okay. Um, 
using <coughs> using uh, Galois theory, uh, the combined field extension. Um, has a generator alpha, and then we can say then uh, x, the vector x is g of alpha, and h of alpha is zero. H is a univariate polynomial. Okay, and uh, this this universal H that governs everything, okay, uh, H, H satisfies the bit complexity condition that, it's, that it has single exponential bit complexity. So we've done a lot of work to get something sane, but it's not good enough because, because we have something with exponential bit, bit complexity, okay. Um, now, the um, th the theorem of uh, Ligarius and Litsko and Weinberger is that GRH implies that uh, um, alpha exists. This algebra, this single algebraic generator alpha. The G, these G's are integer polynomials, so this, this generates everything else. Exists in G, G mod P with P uh, with the bit complexity of P of P uh, order of the log of of the bit complexity of H. So the, it, it, the actually they wrote something stronger than this. This is this is a weak version of the LOW bound. Uh, actually, they do better. Uh, uh, LOW is is somewhat better. So the 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 exponential bad news was taken, but is can be taken back. But you can motivate this heuristically by noting that you have an exponential number of primes available to try to find, to find a root, to find a modular root of H. Okay. So, that, so, so, you, you, so what GRH says is that you just won't be too unlucky be because you have a lot of primes available. You, you just try the primes in order starting from the bottom and you won't be too unlucky. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, you need X. You, it, what LOW proved was exactly uh, effective Chebotarov. Yeah. This is, well, if you if you have learned that the, the, this this is the result is 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 uh, a, a, the effective effective Chebotarov theorem is a corollary of the generalized Riemann hypothesis. Okay. But if you just take a random model for you just assume a random you're looking for a root of h in z mod p. And you just assume a random model for it. You a, h the value. Assume that the values of h are just totally unpredictable in each mod each prime. Then you'd have to be very unlucky uh, not to get a, a prime early on. And GRH implies that you're not, that you won't be. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so then then you're done actually. Okay. So then this then uh, this is this is all we needed. This doesn't look like we, we switched from geometry to algebra, but then, but, then, but then this is the final good news that we were after for the whole algorithm. Well, for, for we're done for my purposes. <laughs> okay, now for the AM algorithm, uh, they proved that there's a, that, uh, it, well, Koran rather, 
uh, so first, LOW proved that there's a regular supply of primes. Yeah, I guess, but poly sorry, polynomial of polynomial, but polynomial in this exponentiated, in this bloated, in this expanded bit complexity. So a single exponential fraction. Yeah, that's but you see, a, a, the AM protocol li wind, <laughs> wins you back. So I will say so. Okay. Okay, so I, so uh, this is for for knottedness uh, in MP, but let me now uh, uh, address Avi's point. Although he figured out the answer, it sounds like uh, for for Quaran's result. Um, there, there, okay, uh, one, if, uh, there does not exist x in c to the n such that f of x is zero, then, uh, the misleading E uh, run out. Okay. They they just pee, they just stop eventually. Okay. Y yeah. Okay. Well, okay. I'm a little bit out uh, out of depth, but they, they somehow they run out. Okay. They. Okay. I think early enough. Okay. Two. If if there exists X. Then I uh, L O W um, uh, implies uh, a regular supply at density uh, order of X of poly of the bit complexity of F. Which is too little for an, an NP algorithm. Uh, oh, okay, one, one over that. Okay, um, so um, the so Arthur uh, asks for a P in a large interval. chosen at random. Okay. That, that, that was his, not my idea, but Koran's final idea for, for what he wanted. Okay. Yeah? Well, you, okay. You don't need to be logarithmic. They they allow you they allow you to be logarithmic. But I so let me address that. Koran and I need something logarithmic to, to take back bad news. <laughs> okay, but so let, the intuition for why they allow I, I I actually talked through it, but I didn't write anything on the board. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll be a, a little bit more explicit for. Okay. So so given. Um, uh, uh, a polynomial H in Z of X, <laughs> and H is something, and uh, degree, uh, so the norm, norm of H is some R, and the degree of H is uh, N, then um, uh, 
what I want to say is that um, the, the bit complexity is order of n times log r, okay, uh, the, this polynomial, okay, and now, uh, now uh, h of x is not equal to zero, uh, uh, in z mod p uh, for all x in z mod p, okay, requires uh, heuristically uh, 1 over e bad luck. <laughs> or w wait, w which direction is it? 1 over e or 1? Yeah, 1 over e bad luck. Just by the, <laughs> um, okay, as uh, for p large, just just by the the, the birthday problem. You know, if you have t 365 people in a room, what's the chance that somebody has a birthday that's January 1st? The chance that it does not happen is one over e. Right, right. And so then uh, uh, you expect uh, uh, P of order the H bit because H is not creative enough to dodge bad luck for longer than that. Okay. <laughs> No, we want, this is bad news, we want h of x equals 0 for some x in z mod p. Right, yeah. right, so the probability that it does not happen when p is large is 1 over e by the undergraduate problem. And so now if you try one prime at another, after another, then eventually you will have good luck. And it, how, can, how well can h prevent you from seeing good luck? Order of the bit, order of the bit complexity. Okay, times uh, times uh, times log. Because you you have the prime number theorem, so you you have you know, right <laughs> by by the prime number theorem. Okay. Um, well. You can you can express interest in the in in the S in the S three result or or in the it actually it's sort of the same it's uh, it's uh <laughs> yeah okay um, um. Well, yeah, I guess I'm not in this in NP first. Okay. Okay. No, that's what I did. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not in this in NP. Um, so, um, the stronger way of doing this is the second way they did, did it, where they had a separate algorithm for connectedness of the surface. So there's the theorem of, of Hawken um, that um, uh, 
um, uh, uh, a disk for an unknot uh, can be made normal, which is the picture that I drew last time. where you have um, uh, stacked um, uh, triangles and quadrilaterals. Okay. <laughs> and uh, a, a normal surface has a binary encoding. Um, so that's the, the way you start, okay? And uh, immediately, um, is a solution to uh, an integer programming problem an integer program plus a combinatorial uh, search um, or certificate um, for the directions of the quadrilaterals. Okay. You just get that right away. It's the it's except the encoder that you're reading now for the range of just local I think that that is the right. Uh, you can you do the combinatorial search first. If you, you you do the combinatorial part first if you like. <sighs> well you 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 have three types of quadrilaterals and it's, no, it's not quite obvious. You want to say that there is zero of two of the three types, and then it looks nonlinear at first glance. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. Now, this looks like it's good enough, but it's not. Okay. <laughs> um, because, okay, so it's an integer solution, but there are infinitely many integer solutions. Okay. <laughs> So you're, you're just not finished, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> you want, that's one thing you want to know. So there, are t there are two issues. So, so, so okay. So so they're now issues, okay? Uh, yeah, so to describe um, a surface S. Okay. Chi of S is equal to 1. This is linear and easy. Okay. <laughs> 2, uh, S is connected. Uh, and 3, S is a small <laughs> integer solution. Not just any integer solution. Well, what does it get you that it's an integer solution? <laughs> okay. The, the, number, the, numbers, the number of pancakes in each stack. You want to say that it's compatible. You just specify how many. Well, those are the equations. Yeah, the, the integers themselves are the number of sheets in each stack of sheets. Right. Right. Now, you want to know that when you cross a triangle, you get the same pattern of stripes on both sides. And that is, is a linear equality. Okay. Okay. 
So, uh, yeah, both both of these are hard. Okay. So I want to state two theorems, th th actually three, three theorems. Yeah, the Euler characteristic part is 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 uh, that's on elementary, uh, element. not I wouldn't say trivial exactly, but it's clearly elementary. Three serious results. The theorem of Hawken uh, is that there exists a disk which is a primitive solution. So not a sum of two other solutions, <laughs> or not a sum of a homogeneous and an inhomogeneous solution. Okay. So then you can sort of see what's going to come just from this theorem alone if you've studied integer programming. But I'll continue. Uh, one, two, theorem of Jaco and Tollefson. Uh, there exists a disk which is a vertex solution. connected. But you can have uh, a solution which is connected but not a vertex. Okay. And then there's the third theorem of uh, Egel, Haas, and Thurston that uh, there exists a polynomial time Algorithm to to uh, or there exists an algorithm in P to calculate the components. Well. Th things are serious in part three because from one point of view, the size is polynomial. The bit complexity of one of these surfaces is polynomial, but the geometric complexity or the unary complexity is exponential. Right. So for, for theorem three, th things are serious because, because if, if, the numer if the unary complexity was polynomial, then, then it's obvious what the components are. Uh, you calculate directly what the components are. But even with exponentially large stacks, you can use, uh, uh, you can say, a generalization of the Euclidean algorithm to calculate the number of components and, in some sense, describe them all. Okay? You're, you're dealing with exp It's polynomial in the bit complexity of the right. Right. Okay. So right. That's what you so one so because because you there's a primitive solution available. One or two implies uh, uh, polynomial uh, bit complexity, not polynomial complexity, but polynomial bit complexity by the Hadamard 
determinant bound. They both do that. Okay. <laughs> and then um, then uh, either um, two or three give you yield um, an NP algorithm. Because, because you, e Merlin gives you a surface with whose boundary is the knot, and uh, you see that it has Euler characteristic one. You're worried whether it's connected. You can check using linear programming that it's a vertex if, if you required a vertex solution, or you use the Egel, uh, sorry, Egel Haas Thurston. You use the Egel Haas Thurston algorithm to check that it's connected. You do, you do either one of those. Okay. So, uh, so I guess I can have some now some remarks. With this preparation, I can have some remarks. Uh, so theorem uh, in prep the papers in preparation of uh, Haas, Joel Haas and myself, uh, the assuming GRH. <coughs> I, I will admit to something. Uh, as soon as Ian Agel saw my paper, the, the one that I p did post on I'm not in this, he guessed, a he guessed this result uh, uh, for uh, S3, <laughs> um, um, but uh, Joel and I are working on it. A a Eagle's not participating. I, I don't know. I, uh, it's, it's for some reason, he's not writing the paper with us. Um, assuming GRH, um, uh, uh, non-homeomorphism with S3, is is in NP. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. This is the input. Okay. Or uh, not in this is in NP um, using uh, Thurston. And not uh, Kronheim and Rothka. Okay. You, you, okay. No, not in this. Not from anymore. Yeah, so I stated last time, I, w I won't repeat the statement, that, that there was a parallel development for recognition of S3. Uh, using, first of all, a, a strengthening of, of Hawkins' methods due to Heim Rubinstein and uh, Abby Thompson. The first of all, that it's recursive. And second, Saul Sleemer looked carefully and s showed that that was an NP also using, using those sorts of methods. Yes? Some, uh, oh, sure. For the trivial link, sure. Well, first of all, the S3 result imply, um, no, it does not imply that. But um, yeah, there will be a result for trivial length. Um, oh, no, wait, let me think. No, I'm, uh, uh, I'm not so sure. I, I have to think about it. It d depends on what kind of link you want it to be. I guess just separate rings is one thing to ask for. Well, that's one. Uh, well, that it is trivial is, I guess, pretty quickly, falls pretty quickly by those methods. You can ask for the surface to be all the disks simultaneously, okay? Um, that, um, you could ask for separate disks. 
Right. Actually, right. You're right. You, you could ask for one surface, which is all s separate disks, or I guess, I guess actually it's enough to ask for one, the disks one at a time by the Dane, by the Dane type thing. Okay. Um, but that it isn't the unlink, I'd have to think about it. I guess I would say probably so. Anyway, let me talk about this. Okay. So you can use, you can use uh, uh, a Hawken approach. to verify uh, some normal uh, tori in M. Okay. And there exists a family of normal tori such that Complement complementary pieces are geometric tor tori and spheres, and actually, it's a little ironic. You don't need to worry about the spheres, but you could are geometric. Okay. You can verify uh, by the Coran method um, that um, the pieces are non trivial. Um, And the tori are uh, incompressible on each side. OK. So it is a fact that if you do start with the, th the, the, th the three sphere, you could find tori to carve it up into something much more complicated. But that's only possible if those tori are what are called compressible, which means that somewhere the torus bounds a disk. Okay. Some there'll be there'll be there'll be handles somewhere. You're cheating because the tori are on one side or the other cutting cutting handles. Okay. So the Quran method stuff that I'm describing, by group theory, you can get a criterion that the tori are, that you're not cheating that you're using the tori only to simplify the three manifold <laughs> when you cut along the tori and not to make it more complicated. And the reason is that the fundamental group of the torus piece won't be cyclic in the image. You can, pr you can prove that, it, that, the to that the torus has a non-cyclic image in the representation. Okay. Um, <laughs> in fact, you never, you c I, we don't know an algorithm to know that the tori give you a full geometric decomposition. We know enough about the tori to show that the manifold isn't S3, but some of the geometric structure could well be hidden in what the prover, prover uh, <coughs> pr provides. Okay. You have to be able to verify that the fundamental group of the torus doesn't inject into one of the components. That it does, that it does inject, right? Right, right. So, so let me let me clarify that. Okay. So, uh, there will be pieces um, n and tori t in the boundary of n. Okay. And representations are rho from pi 1 of n to SL2 z mod p. Okay. 
and into the range that rho restricted to the fundamental group of T uh, is non cyclic. And write that condition algebraically. <laughs> if you couldn't write that condition algebraically, then you couldn't push it through Quoyan's machine. And that implies that T is incompressible. So this incompressibility condition is, is just the T isn't the cheating thing where it's an arm, it, it, where it's the boundary of a handle, handle sticking out on, on the N. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's, that's good enough. In fact, you won't, you won't really know that it's the full decomposition into geometric pieces. The, the, I, we don't know of a way for the verifier to check that, but in, enough that the that the, the sphere is getting cut into simpler pieces and, and that the pieces are not, still non-trivial. So there's one more detail here. Notice that, notice that um, the surface may have exponential geometric complexity. So when you cut, uh, in a topological sense, the pieces are simpler, but geometrically, now the pieces are huge, okay? <laughs> So I will write a key step <coughs> okay n a piece of m after cutting along tori. Okay, is geometrically exp is exponential because because of the geometric size of the surfaces. So that looks bad. But um, uh, most of n. Is, is a surface cross I. So the, the only part that can be geometrically huge is just, is just sla a slab that runs, runs between two sheets that just stay parallel for, for an exponential amount of area. Okay, here bet between, see, the, the only, N can have an interesting part that uses the body of a tetrahedron, but that can only happen once for each tetrahedron. The rest of N is here between two, two sheets of, the, of this huge surface and is topologically boring. Okay? Uh, so N has, has another uh, polynomial sized triangulation. And that's the one, that's the one you actually have to use in the second stage. <laughs> okay, and uh, actually to manage this, you need the, you need this three, you need this third theorem that I've now partly erased to to no, to, to navigate what's going on. You need to know that you have connected tori and, and and not just that you have them, but how they connect, in order to be able to simplify the the, the stuff that you got when you cut. Um, but in, in out, I'm going through it quickly, but but we, we, we can make it work like that. So I will stop there.